Jerry has a very, very distinguished long career on the materials side, as I mentioned, on the photoresist, uh, photoresist industry uh, uh, in the numerous companies. May, but uh, I think your longest career is with Kodak. I, I think that's the that's correct. That's the that's the basic uh, basic parts. So uh, resist uh, has always been been part of the industry, but is is it really? Somehow, sometimes I feel that it's kind of not getting the attention that it should get compared to the hardware. Is that true? I kind of feel that when you talk about materials, you talk about the substrates. You kind of forget about the fact that this is an industry that's based on photography and based on, on chemicals and gases to a great extent. And so I look at it as even Art's presentation, I have to tell you, yesterday talked about the cost of going to 450 millimeter had no chemicals and gas costs associated with that. And it isn't just a straightforward process to go from a, a 300 millimeter wafer to a 450 millimeter wafer. Uh, normally, resist costs really go from generation to generation, uh, and, and that's driven by select nodes uh, in terms of line width control. But I kind of looked at chemicals and gases as being the Rodney danger field of the semiconductor industry. Uh, I, I can remember at a semi semitech meeting where Craig Barrett was standing up and he was talking about the percentage of equipment that Intel had in their fabs that were made by U.S. manufacturers. And I raised my hand at that meeting and I said, well, Craig, can you tell me what percentage of materials are manufactured by U.S. companies. And he says, are there any U.S. companies in materials? <laughs> so again, I think his thought process was materials were silicon more than it was strictly uh, chemicals and gases. Yeah, well, one, one thing is, is when you look at the history of lithography and the lithography development, at, at every, every node, every technology is developed, the resist has played a critical role. It's it's uh, it's part of the part of the getting the economics of scale, being able to to have the energy absorbed at the wafer. So, how this how this role has evolved? Is it same today as it was 20, 30 years ago? Uh, no, I, I I honestly part of what I'm going to tell you is hearsay because I was uh, I, I wasn't there at the beginning, but I. Uh, but I did join Kodak in the microelectro in 1966, and I became involved in the microelectronics business in uh, in 1972. The original photoresist really started out with uh, uh, some of the resists that were really designed for a different industry. They were, you know, the KPRs, which were used in the printing industry, for example, or the uh, which are Kodak photoresist, uh, KTFR, Kodak thin film resist, which was used for uh, gravure industry also for uh, uh, decorating knives, things of this nature, and, and they were adopted by the semiconductor industry. And what happened was, was that the mentality in Kodak was, how could this business be of interest to us? I mean, these are people that are making things smaller and smaller and smaller. We're looking for big markets. And they thought that the that, uh, printed circuit board market was much more interested than the, uh, than the, the, the microelectronics market. As a result, they didn't put the resources necessarily in it as they should, and there were things that were developed by the industry. TI, Motorola got into customization resist internally. Uh, I think Bob helped fund a, a startup uh, of TI fellows that came out and started a value-added reseller business for Kodak, uh, KTI Chemicals, and they customized resist on a basis. Uh, things that Kodak just wasn't flexible enough to do, they were able to do. Well, and also the Kodak was probably interested in selling barrels of resist, not pints that Correct. the industry tend, tend to buy. So. Well, the flexibility to customize on layers just wasn't there. Yeah. In reality, Kodak created a market for a lot of other companies. I think uh, the government and the industry helped fund Hunt getting into the business from the standpoint of uh, a negative resist. And, um, and then the technology change in fact, influenced the movement from negative imaging materials based on cyclized polyisoprene to, to uh, positive imaging materials based on naphthalquinone diazide chemistry. So out of this, let's say, $100 million investment, how much uh, resist uh, supplier would it, how many pints or gallons or barrels they would be sell out of it? Well, uh, that's one of the concerns as technology is going further. And I, I, I'll give you an example of this. Um, the movement from, uh, from 200 to 300 millimeter wafers 
you're in a fact looking at a surface area in square silicon, in square inches of silicon, roughly two and a quarter times. In the fact of resist dispense, uh, there's only about 25% additional resist dispense. So the, the amount of resist per unit of silicon is decreasing. Uh, I know when I was working at semi, and not working at semi Semitech, but interfacing with semi Semitech, one of the first projects they worked on was the idea of reducing this dispense. And somebody came up to me and said, you know, what would you do as a resist supplier if we have the amount of resist dispense per layer? And I said, oh, it's very easy. I'm going to double the price. But the fact of the matter is, it's not that straightforward. The reason we said we'd double the price was, in effect, you have to develop enough money to be able to reinvest back in the business. And, and if you look at the companies that we mentioned, Eastman Kodak Company, they exited the business in 1987. I sold that business to Union Carbide uh, in, in, in 1987. In 1992, Union Carbide exited the business. If you look at what happened before, Monsanto exited the business. Herc Selenes has exited the business. Hunt, uh, uh, Olin Hunt has exited the business. And why do they? Well, the answer is they make more money in much less costly technology. And that's, it's strictly a business decision. So the companies that are most capable of developing products for extreme UV, for example, are really not interested in participating. Do you see on the, on the res resist business that there was uh, technological breakthroughs over the history that's, that's uh, worth, uh, worth mentioning and uh, paying attention to? Yeah, I, I mean, I think very definitely the, 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 um, one of the tools that, that migrated uh, the industry from negative imaging to positive imaging was the, um, was the step and repeat that Art mentioned yesterday. Also the scanning projection system, Perkin Elmer scanning projection systems. When they originally started up, they were a couple years ahead of the, the, the real flow of steppers coming in. And those scanning projection systems, uh, in fact, and originally started up on, on negative imaging resist. There was a problem with that from the standpoint that negative imaging resists were oxygen sensitive. When you were doing contact printing or even proximity printing, you could draw a vacuum to a certain extent. But in the case of projection aligners, what they did, they had enough intensity to drive their way through that, that oxygen sensitivity. But in effect, as you got lower and lower in terms of line width capabilities, uh, cyclized polyisoprene resists were really limited to about three micron in terms, of, in terms of image size. Anything below that, you had to go to a, a, a positive imaging resist. And those positive imaging resists, the disadvantage were they, were they were brittle. The advantage was they didn't, the, the, the artifacts on the mass didn't necessarily uh, cause a problem to the same extent that ne ne negative resist would. Negative resist would leave resist where there was an artifact, whereas positive resist, if they get exposed, that was what's going to come off the, the, uh, the wafer. So, I think the, uh, realistically, that was a major change. The, the step and repeat and the, and, the, uh, and the scanning projection systems were a natural progression to positive resist. And then you got into the area of, of wavelengths and, and, uh, and materials for wavelengths. So there, was a, there was a major shift you know, in the, uh, going from, from uh, 365 to, to 248. And there was another major shift in terms of going to 193 technology. The, the base materials wouldn't transmit light at those areas, so you had to bring in all new chemistry. And I think the industry handled that fairly well, much better than I thought they were going to handle it, because it, they, were, they were working with 35 years' experience on Napoli Quinone de materials, and all of a sudden they had to work with new materials. 